daylight, a strange concept in the Zeppelin world of the obscure backdrops usually associated with their concerts. While some of the stage mystery is naturally gone in the light of day, playing music next to the sun reveals a human side of things rarely witnessed by audiences, and luckily for us, captured by timely photographers. The Zeppelin's 1970s North American stats for daylight shows are slim. Just three shows in a decade, all of them in the Bay Area. Both Oakland 1977 dates and one of the most visually iconic sets taking place in San Francisco. From Robert holding a pigeon to Jimmy Page wearing white like a time-traveling magician, from Bonzo's drums looking like whiskey shots, to Jonesy the Purple Commander of Harmony. Sometimes overlooked in favor of indoor milestones from that same tour, it's a show that deserves to be revisited and understood with the right context. Let's go back to Saturday, June 2nd, 1973, with a humidity of 77% and California sunlight. This is the making of San Francisco Crunch, Led Zeppelin at Kizer Stadium. <laughs> October 17, 1989, the Loma Prieta earthquake damaged very specific parts of the Bay Area, San Francisco included. Kizer Stadium was among the structures impacted by the shaking grounds. It was a year of change for the venue's capacity of almost 60,000 fans after the old design was demolished back in June 1989 in favor of the structure we see today. So how did the stadium came to be? Let's go back to the 1920s almost 20 years after the infamous San Francisco earthquake of 1906. A proposal was made for San Francisco to have a stadium looking to compete with other cities. Things slowly moved in favor of the project, with a $100,000 donation from the Kieser family, thus where the name of the stadium comes from. We can thank Mary Kieser for this. The city was able to get more funds and construction began right away. Kieser Stadium opened its doors on May 2nd, 1925, hosting thousands of sporting events up to the 1950s, where it became the first home for both the San Francisco 49ers and Oakland Raiders. Despite its popularity, NFL players hated its poorly designed dressing rooms, an uneven turf worn out by rain and overuse, and the presence of seagulls that usually arrived on the fourth quarter to, quote, take massive dumps on the players. Now that's what I call good offense by a flock of seagulls. <laughs> so by 1971, the 49ers left to a different stadium, leaving Kieser available for events. The movie Dirty Harry was shot on location, including several scenes shot at Kieser, as the character of Scorpio lived there as a caretaker. Besides Clint Eastwood killing Scorpio, concerts made the Kieser name popular among the rock and roll crowds. 1967 had the anti-war rally of artists, including Quicksilver Messenger Service, Steve Miller, and Country Joe. 1969 had a failed attempt at organizing the Wild Wild West Festival featuring many San Francisco heroes, such as Santana, who played Woodstock just one week prior. Now the event was cancelled as a result of some parties demanding a free show by promoter Bill Graham complaining about logistics having to be paid for. Graham took the heat and was criticized by many, which led him to threaten to close the Fillmore West in response. If you want to help keep the country beautiful, here's how. Pigeon, clean up, let your answer be seen. Give an America clean. Bill Graham managed to finally take rock and roll music to Kieser Stadium in 1973 with a two-part concert series by the name of Dancing on the Outdoor Green 1 and 2. First show took place on May 26th with new writers of the Purple Sage, Waylon Jennings, who enjoyed a major comeback at the time, and of course the Grateful Dead as headliners. As we can see from these pictures, almost the exact same stage configuration was used for Zeppelin's visit, including the yellow and green tent over their heads. California was the last stop of Led Zeppelin's first leg of shows on their North American tour of 1973. 
The band's concert poster ad, released back in April, had four shows in the same state, one in San Diego, two nights at the Forum, and Kieser Stadium, originally scheduled for June 1st. Past their May 28th show, they took a flight to LA, where they were greeted by crazy fans at the airport. Jimmy Page sprained his finger on a fence. Thus, the first night at the Forum was postponed for the next day, on May 31st. Kieser Stadium publicity had been running for a while, with Zeppelin's show scheduled for June 2nd. Unlike the first Dancing on the Alder Green concert, this poster read, plus supporting acts to be announced, leading to much speculation of David Bowie himself performing at the event. Led Zeppelin hadn't played San Francisco since November 1969 at the Winterland Ballroom, so there were huge expectations from Bay Area concert goers to witness the band of Led Zeppelin IV and most recent, Houses of the Holy. The press reported fans camping outside of the stadium the day before. Some 50,000 tickets were sold at 650 each, which outdid the band's record at Tampa on May 5th with a gross number of $325,000 of prime touring money. The Zeppelin was scheduled to perform at 2 p.m. Opening bands that day included Roy Harper's acoustic set, which was not received with much enthusiasm from the audience. It didn't help that Harper said his lady had left him recently. People started booing. Next, it was a turn for The Tubes, a San Francisco-based rock band with a particular style of blending glam rock, comedy, and proto new wave elements. To say they hustled is an understatement. They became well known among musicians, but battled to build a consistent following. Their drummer, Charles Prince, was contacted by former Santana manager Herbie Herbert, now working for pre-Steve Perry Journey. You know the Neil Sean Greg Raleigh version of the band going into jazz fusion? That version of Journey. So they wanted Charles Prince to help them out recording some demos. In a strange turn of events, Herbert then worked out a special deal with promoter Blue Graham. If the Tubes could sell out three local shows, Graham gave them an opening slot on any show they wanted. So guess what happened? The gigs were sold out, thus Herbie Herbert chose Led Zeppelin's show at Kieser Stadium for the Tubes to do their magic. The Graham of course was furious, and their stage performance made things worse. So the band played their set with their singer starting off the show, pretending to snort cocaine while throwing pills at the audience. American rock singer Lee Michaels was next at Kieser Stadium. His soulful style was somewhat successful on the charts, and he switched labels by 1973, going from A&M to Columbia. By the time Michaels finished his set, there was a turn for Led Zeppelin. Problem was, the band was still up in the skies, in their private jet. There was also the fact that Jimmy Page had a last minute change of mind and flew commercial via United Airlines, further extending their delay. Maybe Jimmy got held up back at the Continental Hyatt in LA for some reason. Who knows? So Bill Graham, of course, was infuriated, a raving mad promoter who was the king of the West Coast shows, having to deal with the kings of the 70s. Plan Jones and Bonham plus Peter Grant arrived at the stadium. The crowd demanded Led Zeppelin on stage, and they had a 404 error of page not found. Jimmy's United Airlines flight was just arriving at the local airport, so Bill Graham managed to calm down the crowd by telling them Page was having, quote, a little trouble with his double neck guitar, and he wanted to get it just right for you guys. The audience cheered in response, absolutely thrilled that Jimmy was there at the stadium. In reality, Page was still in a limousine in San Francisco, hoping to make it on time. Led Zeppelin took the stage at 3.30 p.m. Bill Graham and Peter Grant fought over money that day. Bill had to give a lot of bills to the British rock stars, more than he usually gave any other band, and like a great promoter, this didn't sit well with him. I can understand why he booked Zeppelin for Kieser though, but I always wonder, if Bill had such a negative opinion of the Zeppelin entourage, why bother and complain? What we think we attract in business is no different. Every band Bill Graham worked with revered him, and their managers pretty much followed his rules, but not Peter Grant whose motto was, no one gets paid a premium for being hip by my band. Peter remembered the early days of concerts where groups were underpaid and he had enough. The Zeppelin were superstars and not a part of the local scene that had to play by the promoter's rules. Bill could have called any other band, but of course he wanted the Zeppelin money. While Oakland 1977 was the last straw in a clash of personalities, the rivalry pretty much started at Kieser 1973, or maybe made worse at the stadium. 
Zeppelin hadn't been in any Bluegram events since 1969, and their superstar stature plus Atlantic Records support made them untouchable. According to Graham's book, John Barnum pulled a prank on him that day by pouring a bucket of cold water. I can only imagine Bill's reaction knowing that he would get payback, and in a way, he did. Now before we proceed into the audio summary portion of this episode, I want to talk about the photographs for a second. There is Jonesy's infamous Fender 5 or 5 string bass. Despite Jones himself hating its ugly shape, it was certainly a useful tool on stage. Every picture taken at Keezer shows the 5 string instrument. Some cues like Jimmy's double neck guitar and violin bow give away that we're playing the song remains the same and dazed and confused. All the other songs we're left to guess, but it's not hard to think Jones used it on the first three numbers. There's also no quarter, using an unnecessary fog effect and broad daylight, which is a bit absurd as the 77% humidity and sunlight didn't really turn the stage into the song's sinister vibrations. White doves were released from a cage after Stairway to Heaven, with one of them flying to Robert's hand. Jimmy walked up to plan to watch this bird in action. A very special photograph this is. Now John Bonham's outfit was similar to the stuff he wore on his birthday gig on May 31st at the Forum. Robert's clothing remained the same throughout the first leg of the tour and was later immortalized on the band's concert film from New York. Jones's purple outfit made a debut on stage. Jimmy Page wore a white only suit going for a sort of Mahavishnu John McLaughlin look. Or should I say John McLaughlin? Or John McLaughlin? McLaughlin? Jimmy started off the show with a white jacket, which he also used on Zeppelin's May 5th and May 16th dates from the tour.
feeling like a rock and roll band. But I think that was all right, that was okay. <laughs>
was a confrontation with a few people around the back, which, which keeps her name alive. We'd like to thank Bill Graham for getting it all together. That man has given you more music in eight years than anybody else has ever given any music to anybody anywhere else in the world. And I'm glad you realise it. I hope he played, I hope he plays for us to get home now. He never pays us any money. We don't feel all money, but now we're steady and then they went. And one, and two, and three, and four. On behalf of Led Zeppelin, Lee Michaels, Roy Harper, and Tubes, we thank you very, very much for being where you are. Ciao. Very bad turbulence after the Kizer Stadium concert was a nightmare for Zeppelin, as they were up in the air, expecting to arrive safe in Los Angeles. As soon as they landed, they were thankful, and a decision was made to get a better plane. Thus, the Starship became their transportation method for all remaining dates of 1973. The Zeppelin played a next day show at the Forum on June 3rd, as a rescheduled date making up for Jimmy's finger injury. They returned to England days later for a brief vacation period before starting leg number two of their tour on July 6th in Chicago. Kieser Stadium held one more show for the 70s on March 23rd, 1975 with the Snack Benefit Concert. SNAC stands for Students Need Athletics, Culture, and Kicks. The event was organized by Bill Graham as a way of helping public schools in San Francisco get proper funding for their after-school programs not to be caught. It was a historic day for the stadium and you can find plenty of bootleg recordings from the artist on the bill, including a guest spot by Bob Dylan himself. The Japan was also in California at the time, ready to begin a three-night run at the Forum just one day later on March 24th, 1975. The music at Kieser Stadium lives up to the expectations of the photographs. They are great snapshots halfway through the 1973 run to understand their onstage evolution and how they perfected their musical telepathy for what their movie project captured at Madison Square Garden. Think of it as a daylight version of the song Remains the Same. To think they would play their last ever show in America just four years later in the same Bay Area with the same promoter and some numbers that remain the same. Thank you very much for watching and stay tuned for the next Led Zeppelin concert retrospective. Until the next time, bye bye. <laughs>